As we are in the month of November, and in that time when the church commemorates the last things, I would like to today speak to you in the beginning of a series of sermons about the Antichrist and the last uh, and the uh, last days and the end of the world. It is such a broad topic that it could not be done in a single sermon. So today I will do part of it, and in the weeks to come, finish it. First, the Antichrist. Today we will talk about the Antichrist. And in order to do that, we will first look at the texts of sacred scripture that regard him. The first is from the first epistle of St. John, chapter 2, verses 18 to 23. He says, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist cometh, even now there are become many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have remained with us, but that they may be manifest, that they are not all of us. But you have the unction from the Holy One <clears throat> and know all things. I have not written to you as to them who know not the truth, but as to them that know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denieth that Jesus is the Christ? This is Antichrist, who denieth the Father and the Son. <clears throat> Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. He that confesseth the Son hath the Father also. And from the same epistle, chapter 4, verse 3, And every spirit that dissolveth Jesus is not of God. And this is Antichrist, of whom you have heard that he cometh, and he is now already in the world. The second epistle of St. John, chapter 1, verse 7, For many seducers are gone out into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a seducer and an Antichrist. The second epistle of St. Paul to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 3 to 11. Let no man deceive you by any means, for unless there come a revolt first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and is lifted up above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself as if he were God. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know what withholdeth, that he may, <clears throat> that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity already worketh, only that he who now holdeth do hold, until he be taken out of the way. And then that wicked one shall be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus shall kill with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Him whose coming is according to the working of Satan, in all power and signs and lying wonders, and in all seduction of iniquity to them that perish, because they receive not the love of truth, that they might be saved. Therefore God shall send them the operation of error to believe lying, that all may be judged who have not believed the truth, but have consented to iniquity. St. Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 to 5. And, and let no man seduce you, for many will come in my name, saying, and, uh, saying I am Christ, and they will seduce many. Now, these are the passages of sacred scripture which refer to the coming of the Antichrist. There are others which are more obscure, especially from the Old Testament, but these are the ones which absolutely mention him and are taken by all commentators and the fathers to refer to the Antichrist. And toward the end of this series of sermons, we will go back to these texts after we have spoken about the Antichrist and the end of the world and give an interpretation of specific things in those texts 
that we have just read, which are very, very topical to what is going on today. Now, first, the idea of the Antichrist in general. The, the Antichrist begins with the struggle between the good angels and the bad angels. It is the age-old struggle from the time of creation between good and evil, between those who love God and those who despise God. This struggle continues with Adam and Eve. When they sin, they take the part of the Antichrist. With Cain and Abel, we see the just man in Abel and the evil man in Cain. With Isaac and Ishmael, the just, the elect, the saved, those who please God, those who go to heaven in Isaac, and in Ishmael, those who despise God. We see the distinction in Joseph and his brethren. Joseph the just. His brethren. Those who despise God. We see it in the prophets and their persecutors. The prophets who are the just and are who are precursors prefigurations of the true Christ and their persecutors, the unfaithful Jews who put them to death. And we see it ultimately in our Lord and the Pharisees. Our Lord, the just man par excellence because His sacred humanity is joined to the second person of the Blessed Trinity and the Pharisees who embody all of the infidelity of Israel. If we could add it up in a column, if we could take all of the infidelity of the Jews in the Old Testament and add it up in a column, we could put that in the Pharisees. For they see the Messiah before their eyes. They see truth incarnate before their eyes. They see Him do the miracles which prove His divinity and they nonetheless reject Him with a hardness of heart that is incapable of being understood. The scriptural view of the Antichrist is the following. First, that he will be the arch enemy of Christ, opposed to Christ personally. That he will be the last and the worst oppressor of the church. That he will be, not literally, but symbolically, the son of Satan, or Satan incarnate. It is not possible for Satan to become incarnate in the same way that the second person of the Blessed Trinity became incarnate. But in a way, Satan can so control a man because of the man's own sins and free will to be controlled in such a way that he could be like Satan incarnate. Furthermore, the Antichrist opposes the true religion and takes his seat in the temple of God. The holy place, proclaiming himself to be God or acting in such a way as to be divine. The fathers have many comments about the Antichrist. St. Irenaeus, who lived in the uh, second and third century and who was a disciple of St. Polycarp, 
who was in turn a disciple of St. John the Apostle, says this. He says he will be the sum of all the evil that has ever taken place. That the Antichrist is waiting while his many lesser predecessors work evil and attempt to destroy the church. And that sheds light on what St. John the Apostle said, that the Antichrist was already active because, as St. Irenaeus says, there are many precursors, predecessors, almost prophets of the Antichrist who show in a certain way what he will be like. The Antichrist will come suddenly, he says, quoting St. Paul, for when they shall say, peace and security, then shall sudden destruction come upon them. The Antichrist, he says, will arise from the tribe of Dan, for which reason they are left out of the elect. And if you read the epistle, of the Feast of All Saints. It it talks about the members of the tribes of Israel who are signed. But look in that epistle for the tribe of Dan. It is not there. They are the lost tribe of Israel. They are left out of the elect. And he says the Antichrist will come from the tribe of Dan. And that he will rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and establish the evil cult of himself there. And as you know, there is a very strong movement to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, who lived in the 3rd century, said this about the Antichrist, that he is awaited by those who rejected Christ course referring to the Jews and people who after the gospel is preached to them reject Christ even if they should be Gentiles for our Lord said if another shall come in his own name him you will receive he said that to the Jews if another shall come in his own name him you will receive and so it is the general opinion of commentators and and fathers, that it will be the Jews as a whole, as a people who will welcome and usher in to power the Antichrist. The period, St. Cyril of Jerusalem says, of the Antichrist will be preceded by a period of division among the faithful about what is true and false doctrine, what is good and evil morals. He, the Antichrist, shall seize the power of the Roman Empire and falsely style himself as the true Christ deceiving the Jews. Now you might think that's a little out of date because the Roman Empire collapsed in 476, but as we speak, what is happening in Europe but the European Union? And it has always been the desire of Europeans to reestablish the Roman Empire. It was even spoken of in the 16th and 17th century that they have never been able to reestablish the unity of the Roman Empire. So he shall seize the power of the Roman Empire and falsely style himself as the true Christ, deceiving the Jews. At first the Antichrist, he says, will put on a show of kindness and goodness. And once he is in power over Jew and Gentile, he will become horrible. The same saint says, he will come at a time when there shall not be left one stone upon another in the temple of the Jews. And that's a very interesting comment because when Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was also destroyed with it, 
but there were still some parts of it left, the foundations. And these foundations were worked upon during the time of Julian the Apostate, which was about 350 to 360 A.D. Now, St. Cyril is writing about a 100 years before that. When, Saint, when Julian the Apostate, the emperor, tried to rebuild the Temple of Jerusalem, flames came out of the foundations and they had to abandon the project. And that is when the, the final destruction of the temple came, when there was an attempt to rebuild it. And this is attested to, even by pagan writers, the fact that the flames came out of the foundations of the temple. So that is when the prophecy was totally fulfilled of our Lord that stone shall not rest upon stone. St. Augustine said the Antichrist will come just before the end of the world and will be smitten by Christ in his second coming. And the Antichrist will be aided in his fight against the church by heretics within the church. St. Augustine writing about 400 A.D. That he will be aided in his fight against the church by heretics within the church. The Antichrist, he says, will reign for three and a half years. I, for the says, and when the, when it's St. Paul says that he will put himself in the temple of God, St. Augustine is in doubt as to whether this refers to the temple of the Jews rebuilt in Jerusalem or the church. He says it may refer to the fact that he will sit in the church. An interesting comment. And the Antichrist, he says, as an agent of Satan, will conduct the most severe persecution that the church has ever witnessed. And so we will end here today the first part of this sermon. There are other fathers to speak about, other commentators, and we will continue it next week. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Today I continue a sermon, a series of sermons, which I began last week at another Mass, uh, and that is concerning the end of the world in general, and we are concerned today uh, with the Antichrist. I was speaking last week about the Antichrist. I continue to speak about him today. <clears throat> and we saw the... Um, the predictions of some of the fathers, namely St. Augustine and St. Cyril of Jerusalem. Uh, we today are looking at some of the other observations of the fathers of the church concerning the Antichrist. They say for three and one half years, all public worship will be done away with. And they also comment that Rome will be the seat of the Antichrist, something which was uh, repeated at La Salette by our Blessed Lady. Rome will be the seat of the Antichrist. They also say that the Antichrist will perform wondrous signs and miracles and that he will persecute the church more cruelly than ever. Now, Cardinal Newman, writing a, a little over a hundred years ago, also had some interesting comments about the Antichrist. He said that Antiochus, in the book of Maccabees, is a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. Now, who is Antiochus? Antiochus was the governor of Syria, which took in, at that time, Palestine. And he was the, the Greek the successor to Alexander, essentially, living about uh, <clears throat> between the years 200 and 150 B.C., approximately that time. And what he did was to introduce into the Jewish worship the practices of the pagans. And so he stopped the true Jewish worship at that time true, the true faith at that time, in the temple and ordered the priests to carry on 
pagan worship. And he was opposed by the Maccabees. Now, if you read the first and the second book of Maccabees, which are the last books of the Old Testament, it is all about the struggle of the faithful Jews against the tyrant Antiochus who wanted to change the Jewish religion. And writing over a hundred years ago, it is interesting that he said Antiochus is a foreshadowing of the Antichrist, which says to us that part of what the Antichrist will do will be an attempt to change the true faith. He also said that Julian the Apostate was a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. He was a man who, as a young man, spent time with St. Basil and St. Gregory Nazianzen as a student in Athens, studying theology. But yet, when he ascended the throne of Rome, he repudiated the Catholic faith altogether and wanted to reinstate the worship of the Roman gods. And again, Cardinal Newman says he is a, a prefiguration of the Antichrist, an apostate. And he also said Mohammed was a prefiguration. Now he points out that in each of these cases, infidelity and heresy preceded these antichrists. In the case of the, of the Antiochus, you had the infidelity of the Jews. For Antiochus prevailed upon most of the Jewish priests to accept the new religion. With Julian the Apostate, he came right on the heels of Arianism, which was the denial of the divinity of Christ. And Mohammed came on the heels of centuries of heresy in the East, notably Nestorianism and other heresies concerning Christ. And Cardinal Newman said, this is a writing in the 1860s or 1870s, feels that the present times are ripe for the Antichrist because of the apostasy of nations. See, already in the 19th century, nations were beginning to throw off the faith altogether. He points out that it has been universally accepted by Catholic tradition that the Antichrist would be of Jewish origins and would observe Jewish rites. And when we see today the prevalence and ascendancy of Judaism, we are not surprised that this would be a characteristic of the Antichrist. And he said that the Antichrist will institute his own worship. So these are very interesting, especially in the, that they were written at a time when this situation in the church was not foreseeable. And so, having commented all of these things, we can make a, a list or summary of what the signs of the end of the world are. And they are these. The preaching of the gospel throughout the whole world. This is mentioned as one of the conditions for the end of the world in the, excuse me, for the, uh, yes, the end of the world in the Catechism of the Council of Trent. The conversion of the Jews. St. Paul has a number of places where he makes reference to the conversion of the Jews. That is a general conversion. Maybe not down to the last person, but a general conversion of the Jews before the end of the world. The return of Elias, and most say also Henoch, but at least Elias, that is someone who will oppose the Antichrist. A general apostasy from the faith, which we are certainly living through right now. This is also mentioned by the Catechism of the Council of Trent 
as one of the conditions to be fulfilled before the second coming of Christ. The reign of the Antichrist. This is the third condition mentioned by the Catechism of the Council of Trent. Now, when that was written, none of these things, either the preaching of the gospel throughout the world or the general apostasy or the reign of Antichrist had taken place. But we see now that two of these things have been fulfilled. That is the preaching of the gospel throughout the world and the general apostasy. So we're waiting for the reign of the Antichrist. The persecution of the just and the disturbances of nature. These will precede the end of the world. The abomination of desolation in the holy place spoken of by Daniel the prophet. That is, some sort of awful form of religion in the holy place, which is, of course, the church. The sign of the Son of Man appearing in the heavens, which, according to all the commentators, is the sign of the cross. The destruction of the world by fire and the coming of Christ to judge the living and the dead. And then the renewal of the face of the earth, where the earth will become the place in which the resurrected just will live, all the while enjoying the beatific vision of God. That is, in summary, the signs of the end of the world. What their order is, and and when they will come, of course, no one knows, but these are the things which must take place. Now, there is a, another interesting thing about all of this, and that is the theory of the seven ages of the church. In the Apocalypse, in the second book of the Apocalypse, uh, the second chapter of the Apocalypse, you have the letter to the seven, ch- the seven churches, or the seven angels of the seven churches. And whereas most commentators say that these refer to bishops of dioceses living at that time. There are some who say that these are not bishops of dioceses living at that time, but rather this is a message of Christ to the church in seven seven successive ages. And it is interesting if we look at that. The first letter is to the church of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus means thrust or force in Greek. And this corresponds to the energy of the apostolic age, but which is also marred by false adherents and false apostles and the misery, excuse me, the heresy of Gnosticism and the sect of the Nicolaites. So there is already some of, some of the Antichrist or the work of the Antichrist starting at that time. And next is the Church of Smyrna. And so this goes from the Apostolic Age, which closes at about 100 A.D., to 312 A.D., And, according to the commentators, this comes from the word myrrh, which means death. And this is the period of the persecutions. And this text in the Apocalypse makes reference to the ten persecutions. That is, the persecutions of the ten emperors who put to death the Christians. The next age is represented by the letter to the angel or bishop of Pergamum. Now, Pergamum was a city famous for its writers because it was the place where paper was produced. And this is the age of heresies. And this goes from the year 312 A.D. to 800 A.D., the time of the great doctors of the church and the fathers, St. Augustine, St. Gregory Nazianzen, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Basil, all of the great writers of the church who 
explain the faith so deeply and so perfectly. The next stage is that of Theatira. And this represents the splendor and triumph of the Middle Ages. This goes from 800, according to the commentators, to 1800 A.D. That is, 800 is the crowning of Charlemagne. And the crowning of Charlemagne marks the beginning of Christian Europe for the states of Europe in the person of Charlemagne and his successors and the subsequent kings recognized the Catholic faith as the one true faith. And for a thousand years, from 800 to 1800, there was a recognition of the true faith. At the same time, however, there are schisms and heresies. There is the break of the Greeks in the 11th century, and then there is the Albigensian heresy in the 13th century, and the Protestants in the 16th century. But nevertheless, as a whole, the recognition of the true faith holds. And then there is the Church of Sardis. Now, this is our age. And the Church of Sardis, Sardis is is the place where Croesus reigned. Croesus was a man in the in the ancient times who was extremely rich, extremely rich. And this, the word Sardis conjures up the notion of money and prosperity. And Cardinal Bio, who was a French cardinal writing in the 1920s says this about the church of Sardis. Quote, everywhere apostasy, everywhere defection, and while most defect from the faith, a few will retain the faith of Christ. Unquote. Now this, he was writing in the 1920s and predicted that in this age and in a short time there will be a general apostasy from the faith. He also predicted in the 1920s that the state of Israel would be established and that there would be a push and an urge to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And it is commended to the church of Sardis that it invariably retain with all its strength whatever has been handed down by the apostles. It says, And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things, saith he, that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast the name of being alive and thou art dead. If that is not a description of the Novus Ordo, I don't know what is. Thou hast the name of being alive, and thou art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain. Be watchful and strengthen the things that are, that remain, which are ready to die. For I find not thy works full before my God. Have in mind, therefore, in what manner thou hast received and heard. So there is a call to retain tradition there. Have in mind, therefore, in what manner thou hast received and heard, and observe and do penance. Observe and do penance. If then thou shalt not watch, I will come to thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know at what hour I will come to thee. But thou hast a few names in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. That refers to a few who will not believe the lie. And they shall walk with me in white, because they are worthy. He that shall overcome shall thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, and I will confess his name before my father, and before his angels. After that comes the sixth age, which is the 
that of Philadelphia, the Church of Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. And according to the commentators, this is an age of triumph for the church. And it is ushered in by the conversion of the Jews, who, by the power and influence that they have retained from the age of prosperity, will give the church, by their conversion, an age of great splendor and strength. And the final age is that of Laodicea. This comes from a Greek word which means the judgment of the peoples. Laos means people decay. In Greek it means judgment. And this is the second coming of Christ. So I will end here this installment of this series of sermons concerning the Antichrist and the end of the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today I would like to continue the series that I'm doing on the end of the world. And we'll talk about today the abomination of desolation in the holy place which you see reference to in the Gospel of today's Mass. Now, you must understand that the, when our Lord is speaking about the end of the world, He is also, at the same time, speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem, because the destruction of Jerusalem was a prefiguration of the end of the world. And I mentioned to you in a, another sermon a year or two ago that our blessed Lord, if you analyze the texts clearly and carefully, you'll see that he distinguishes between these days, and that is referring to the destruction of Jerusalem, and those days, referring to the end of the world. And certain things apply to the end of the world, which do not apply to the destruction of Jerusalem, and vice versa. And at the end, if you notice in this gospel, he says, this generation, meaning the one that he's talking to right there, shall not pass away until all these things have been done, referring to the destruction of Jerusalem. So if you read that gospel again in your spare time, you'll see that our Lord goes back and forth between these days and those days. But he says, he refers to the abomination of desolation in the holy place as written in the prophet Daniel. So let us look at the prophet Daniel. This is in reference to the very famous prediction of Daniel which gives us the time of the appearance of Christ. It's Daniel chapter 9, verses 23 to the end, to 27. And he instructed me and spoke to me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to teach thee that thou mightest understand. From the beginning of thy prayers the word came forth, and I am come to show it to thee because thou art a man of desires. Therefore, do thou mark the word and understand the vision. So God is speaking to Daniel. He says, Seventy weeks are shortened upon thy people and upon thy holy city, that transgression may be finished, and sin may have an end, and iniquity may be abolished, and everlasting justice may be brought, and vision and prophecy may be fulfilled, that the saint of saints may be anointed." Know thou therefore and take notice that from the going forth of the word to build up Jerusalem again unto Christ the Prince there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks and the street shall be built again and the walls in straightness of times. And after sixty-two weeks Christ shall be slain and the people that shall deny him shall not be his and a people with their leader that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be waste, and after the end of the war the appointed desolation. And he shall confirm the covenant with many in one week, and in the half of the week the victim and the sacrifice shall fail, 
and there shall be in the temple the abomination of desolation, and the desolation shall continue even to the consummation and to the end. That is what is written in the prophet Daniel. And that is why the Jews were quite guilty in not recognizing the Messiah because his very time was predicted by this prophecy which could not have been more clear. The Messiah was to come in the middle of the last of the 69 weeks of years that were to be reckoned from the edict of Ataxerxes in 454 B.C., which gave the order to the Jews to return from Jerusalem, that, excuse me, to return to Jerusalem from Babylon and to rebuild the city. If you recall, the Jews had their city destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in punishment for their sins and were taken to Babylon, that is present-day Iraq, for 70 years. And at the end of those 70 years, Ataxerxes, the then Persian ruler, for the Chaldeans had lost to the Persians, gave the order in 454 B.C. that the Jews should return to Jerusalem and build up the city. So there is already a fulfillment of the prophecy. The weeks are divided into three parts, 7, 62, and 1. The first seven, that is the 49 years, apply to the time in which the walls and houses of Jerusalem would be rebuilt. The 62 weeks, which means 62 weeks of years, that is 434 years, brings us up to the year 430 A.D. Excuse me brings us up to the year 30 A.D., which is the beginning of Christ's public ministry. During the last week, Christ is put to death. That is, the half of the week, three and a half years, for three and a half is half of seven, three and a half years after the beginning of His public ministry, our Lord is put to death. Daniel then makes reference to the leader who will come and shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. This refers to Titus, the emperor, the general at that time, Titus, later emperor, who in 70 AD laid siege to the city of Jerusalem and completely destroyed it. It is here that Daniel speaks about the abomination of desolation, in reference to the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, the abomination of desolation, a more accurate translation of the Hebrew term, for Hebrew is a, an obscure language that uses a lot of figures of speech, a more accurate translation is the abomination of the desolator. That is, the abomination of him who is doing the desolation in the holy place. <clears throat> now, what is meant by this abomination? Abomination in the Old Testament stands for any worship of false gods, any false religion, false worship. During the time of Antiochus, which uh, was in the time of the Maccabees, and I spoke about this in my last sermon, Antiochus, who was the uh, Ptolemaic ruler, the Greek ruler of that area of the world, set up right in front of the altar of the bloody sacrifices, where the bulls and the lambs and other sacrifices were done, set up an altar to the Olympic gods in Jerusalem. And that was referred to in the book of Maccabees as the abomination in the holy place. So the meaning is clear, that it is false worship in the holy place. 
Now, before the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple was profaned. There are diverse theories on what is the abomination of desolation. St. Hilary said that it is the Antichrist who will be adored as if God. Referring to the end of the world, obviously. St. Jerome says, referring to the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, that it refers to the statue of Caesar placed in the temple by Pontius Pilate. When Pontius Pilate came to Rome, he put a statue of Caesar in the temple. But the Jews made such a ruckus about it that he pulled it out. Some commentators say that it refers to the sins of the priests, especially those committed in the temple. St. Augustine and many others say that it refers to the Roman siege of Jerusalem for the Gentiles were always considered by the Jews to be an abomination and they saw the military standards of the Romans which they considered to be idols. But many others, and this is the most probable meaning, is that it refers to the profanation of the temple which took place in 68 A.D., just two years now before the complete destruction, when the Jewish zealots turned the temple into a fortress. The Romans had already come in 66 A.D. to attack Jerusalem, and in reaction to this attack, the Jews mounted a defense of Jerusalem and there was a party among the Jews known as the Zealots. They were thieves and murderers. They were criminals, but they had, they said, a zeal for the law. And they turned the temple into a fortress which was a desecration of the temple. And... <clears throat> The sacrifices therefore ceased in accordance with the, with the prophecy of Daniel, who says the sacrifices shall cease. And the, the, uh, the temple was strewn with dead bodies. And this is, we are told this from Josephus. He says not only was the city under the zealots strewn with bodies, but the temple itself was strewn with dead bodies. That is a desecration of the temple according to the law for dead bodies were unclean and could not be in the temple. And the cessation of the daily sacrifice and this abomination in the temple was a sign for the Christians at that time who were living in Jerusalem to take to the mountains the Christians left the city before it was destroyed and they took to the mountains. And that is a very strong indication that this profanation of the temple under the zealots was the true fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel and of the prophecy of our blessed Lord. And, and they took it as their sign to leave. So St. Simeon, who was the bishop of Jerusalem at the time, left Jerusalem and installed himself in a small city called Pella, P-E-L-L-A, and awaited the destruction of Jerusalem and did not return to Jerusalem until the time of Trajan, the emperor, which was a good many years later. Now, how does all of this refer to the end of the world? As I said, the events in Jerusalem before the end of the world, before the destruction of Jerusalem, are a prefiguration, according to all of the commentators of the gospel, of the end of the world. Hence, we should expect an abomination of desolation in the holy place at the end of the world. That is why St. Jerome said that the abomination of desolation refers to heresies within the church at the end of the world. And other authors and commentators have consistently referred to this. 
And so we should expect before the end of the world the a, a false worship in our holy places. And obviously this is fulfilled. We have a false worship in our holy places and that is why you are here. I think though that it would be legitimate to expect, however, a more shocking abomination, like a woman priest or some sort of uh, perhaps the statue of Buddha in in St. Peter's Basilica, something that is so shocking that no one who has common sense and who is in his right mind could possibly make a mistake that a false religion was reigning in the walls of the Catholic Church, or I should say Catholic churches, that Catholic churches, the holy places, have been given over to falsehood, to false worship, to a false cult. And I think that the Novus Ordo is gradually leading up to such an abomination. Already we we are promised these in the year 2000, many abominations to take place against the first commandment of God. But that is my opinion, that it will lead up to some more dreadful abomination. But we already have the false worship in the holy place. So we will terminate here this installment of the series of sermons on the end of the world, and next week will be the final one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today I would like to complete the series uh, on the end of the world and look at a text of St. Paul which I originally gave you in the first uh, of the series but did not uh, talk about it in detail. And I'll read the text to you again. This is from the second book of second epistle to the Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 to 11. Let no man deceive you by any means, for unless there come a revolt first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and is lifted up above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself as if he were God. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know that what withholdeth, that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity already worketh, only that he who now holdeth do hold, until he be taken out of the way. And then what that wicked one shall be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus shall kill with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming." Him whose coming is according to the working of Satan in all power and signs and lying wonders, and in all seduction of iniquity to them that perish, because they receive not the love of truth, that they might be saved. Therefore God shall send them the operation of error to believe lying, that all may be judged who have not believed the truth, but have consented to iniquity. St. Paul here is responding to those who have misinterpreted his words from his first visit to Thessalonia, saying that he preached that the second coming of Christ was close at hand. So he's saying, no, it is not necessarily close at hand because these things must happen before the second coming of Christ. And he says, first there must be a great revolt and in Greek, this is apostasia. <clears throat> this, that is a great apostasy from the faith, which is the way most of the commentators have taken it. And then the Antichrist, who is the man of sin here, before the second coming. And he says, and in all seduction of iniquity to them that perish, because they receive not the love of truth, that they might be saved. What is very characteristic of our age is the failure to love the truth. See what he says. Because they receive not the love of truth. The 
peculiar problem of our age is not its immorality or its faithlessness or its godlessness because people have been immoral and faithless and godless in times past, perhaps even more so than now. But which what is characteristic of our age is that it is post-Christian. That is, the gospel has been preached and it has been rejected. People are indifferent to the truth. And this is institutionalized in the ecumenism of Vatican II. Not only institutionalized, but consecrated as if it were the true religion. It is considered a virtue if we should be indifferent to what is true. And if we should consider the Buddhists and the Protestants and the Confucianists and the Hindus as means of salvation. That is what is characteristic of our time, is this total indifference and hardness to the truth. For although the Romans in the ancient time were certainly worldly and sensuous, they were not indifferent to the truth. For when they saw the truth profess itself in the arenas of Rome and in the empire where Catholics were eaten for the sake of the truth, they fell to their knees eventually. And even before Constantine, which was when the faith was established in the Roman Empire, there were many, even of the senatorial class, even of the emperor's household that belonged to Christianity. Because they loved the truth, or at least some of them did. Many of them. But today, there is a complete disregard, indifference for the truth. And we have seen this in recent events in our own country, where our president has made an institution of lying. And people really don't care whether he lies or not. Because they are indifferent to the truth. St. Paul continues, Therefore God shall send them the operation of error to believe lying, that all may be judged who have not believed the truth, but have consented to iniquity. That is, God will permit many people to be deceived as a punishment for their indifference to the truth. There will be an operation of error That means something in the world that will produce and diffuse error. Is this the Novus Ordo? It very well may be. For what is a universal source of error for the whole world than the Reformed religion? And St. Paul gives us the reason for the Novus Ordo, or the operation of error, whatever it may be, and that is to accuse and judge those who have not adhered to the faith. It is to shake out the church. For if there were not the operation of error, the apostates, those who inside really, who really did not believe, would remain with an aspect, a an appearance of adhering to Catholicism. But this operation of error will shake them out so that they may be accused and judged because they have not believed the truth but have consented to iniquity. They have loved it. They have loved iniquity. He says an interesting thing in verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity already worketh, only that he who now holdeth do hold until he be taken out of the way. It's an obscure text, but it seems as if he's saying 
that the mystery of iniquity, that is the forces of Antichrist, even at his time, are working. And St. John says the same thing in his epistles. They are working, but they cannot have their effect until some obstacle is removed, something like a dam that holds back water. Until that is removed, the terrible effects of this mystery of iniquity cannot take place. And this again seems to apply to our own times. For if ever there was, there seemed to be the removal of an obstacle to evil, it was Vatican II. It was the 1960s. In which every aspect of our lives was put into the most terrible upheaval. And even the wars of this century, with all of the hardships that they brought, did not and have not equaled the upheaval in our lives as a result of this loosening of the mystery of iniquity upon the world. There is a text in the Apocalypse which talks about the angel descending and opening the bottomless pit with all sorts of insects and horrible things crawling out of it. And one wonders if this is not what applies to our own age. There is a spiritual aspect about the second coming. It is the time of the glory of Christ. Every time we say the Our Father, we say, Thy kingdom come. And the kingdom of Christ, which is the church, is has only in a certain way imperfectly come because the final triumph of Christ has not yet occurred. And the church suffers. And the church has within it sinners, which is only a temporary thing. But the second coming of Christ is the glory of Christ. And therefore, those who love Christ look forward to the great day of his coming. They do not look at it with horror, but rather... They look forward to it because it is the glory of Christ, despite whatever sufferings this day may bring with it. The sufferings it will bring. But it is, it pertains to the virtue of charity that we love God above all things. Above all of our own considerations of our comforts. And we look forward, therefore, to the glory of Christ. St. Paul, in his first epistle to the Thessalonians, exhorts us to virtue. He says, lest the day of Christ should overtake us. And today we have the gospel of the end of the world, just as we had last week. But this week it is looking forward to the coming of Christ. For Advent is the time of preparation for the first coming of Christ. But it is merely a commemoration. Christ has already come the first time. We are just thinking about it now. And so the gospel of today's Mass should recall to us that the, in fact, the more important coming that we await during Advent is the second coming of Christ and that our commemoration of Christmas is a looking forward to the second coming of Christ, when he will come not in the humility of the stable, but in all power and majesty and glory to judge the living and the dead. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we have the familiar gospel of the end of the world, which we also had last Sunday. And the church gives this gospel twice because the emphasis is a little different in each case. Here we are beginning Advent and we are looking forward to the commemoration of the coming of Christ 
at Christmas, but which is only a commemoration, for he has already come the first time. The church, therefore, is reminding us that we are looking forward to the second coming of Christ, the coming of Christ that will not be in humility and obscurity like that of Bethlehem, but in glory and in majesty. The coming of Christ not for a time of mercy, but for a time of judgment, justice, reward and punishment. The Catechism of the Council of Trent says there are three signs for Christ's second coming. The first is the preaching of the gospel to the whole world. <clears throat> the second is a general apostasy from the faith. The third is the coming of the Antichrist. When that catechism was written, none of those things had taken place. Now, two of those things had taken, have already taken place. The one is the preaching of the gospel to the whole world, which was finished pretty much by the end of the reign of Pius XI in the late 1930s, where every single person practically in the whole world, from Africa to the South Pacific to all of the remote parts of South America and Russia, all of those places had heard of the Holy Gospel. We are presently going through and accomplishing the second of these conditions that is a general apostasy from the faith, which will be a preparation for the third condition, which is the Antichrist. And from this condition of the Antichrist, this idea that there will be a person who will falsely lead humanity in a direction which is completely contrary to the law of salvation, the law of grace, which Christ has promulgated, completely contrary to his faith, someone who will be, for all intents and purposes, the incarnation of the devil. The fact that that is predicted and that he will come should tell us something about our Lord himself, which is that he is the Lord of history. That as he says, you are either with him or against him. And if you are not with him, you are against him. If you are not of Christ, if you are not with Christ, you are against him. There is no possible neutrality. And so the history of the anti-Christian forces go back into the Old Testament. For even in the Old Testament, they looked forward to Christ and there were always people and institutions that persecuted the chosen people who in some way wanted to crush the hope of the future Savior. And in the New Testament, we see already from the time of Herod the Great raising the sword, killing the children in Bethlehem, we see the beginnings of Antichrist and the crucifixion of Christ by both the Jews and the Gentiles and the further persecution of the church by both the Jews and the Gentiles in the New Testament. And we look at the whole history of the church, we look at the history of the persecutions, the history of the heresies. For the way to wipe out Christ is either by killing Him or by altering Him. And it is heresy that wishes to destroy Christ by the alteration of Christ. No matter what it is, whether it is Islam, or Judaism, or Protestantism, whatever it is, 
Arianism in the early church, all of these things are, to a greater or lesser extent, part of the forces that amass in order to follow Antichrist. All of them contribute to it, just like all the little streams come together to form a great river. And finally, when all of these things have been organized under the influence of the devil, there will appear this man of sin, as St. Paul calls him, the Antichrist. Christ is the Lord of history. And we should understand, therefore, that this great apostasy from the faith that we are going through has a a very good reason to exist in the providential plan. This is not a surprise to God. This is not something that went wrong. This is something that God is permitting, just as He permitted all of the other things that I mentioned, the heresies and the persecutions, something that God is permitting in order that His glory be manifested. For when Christ comes the second time, He will come upon a world that does not have the faith. He Himself said it. When the Son of Man shall return, will He find faith upon the earth? He will come upon an earth which has practically entirely rejected Him. And He will judge that earth and destroy it. And so this time of general apostasy from the faith is something permitted by God. And Dom Guéranger, the author of the liturgical year, which many of you read, said an interesting thing. That Christ will come back for the Jews. He will convert the Jews before the end of the world, but He will not give the Gentiles a second chance. So why does God permit this great apostasy? For one reason, in order to show His glory, that is, to show the faith of those who resist There was a lot of rotten fruit on the tree of the church before Vatican II. A lot of people who didn't believe, especially among the clergy, and a lot of lay people who were weak in their faith. And when the wind blows, when the tree is shaken, all of the rotten fruit falls down to the earth. And so God is permitting this as the general plan of His judgment of the earth. And as well, He is permitting it in order to perfect the faith of those who resist In last week's Gospel, he spoke about the destruction of Jerusalem, which is a prefiguration of the end of the world. And he told those people, things of the destruction of Jerusalem are coming about, flee into the mountains. Leave Jerusalem. It is going to be leveled. And it was. Those days will be terrible. Flee Jerusalem, go into the mountains. That means that people had to leave their goods, their homes, their families, their friends, and go and live in the rough poverty of a mountain dwelling in order to avoid the destruction of Jerusalem. 
In today's Gospel, he says the same thing. As you know, the summer is coming from the signs on the trees. So also you know that the Son of Man is coming from certain signs. Now, these signs are not here yet, but we are going through one of the predicted signs. And this great apostasy from the faith has affected all of us deeply and dramatically. Our lives are completely altered by it. Just as people had to flee to the mountains before the destruction of Jerusalem, so also over the past 40 years, the lives of Catholics who are resisting the modern apostasy has been altered deeply. Our lives will never be the same as a result of it. It has altered our lives more deeply than in many cases the great wars of the past century altered the lives of people, transferring them around from place to place in Europe reducing them to suffering and poverty. This has lasted 40 years. And look at how it has driven a wedge into your families, for example. And all the things, all the inconveniences that you have in order to preserve the faith. And what you need to do is not complain about these things and not be half-hearted about these efforts that you make, but understand that this is for your perfection, that this apostasy is being permitted in order that you glorify God, in order that you be faithful to the graces that He is giving you in order to be more faithful. Don't, like Lot's wife, look back upon burning Sodom and turn into a pillar of salt. Don't look back upon the worldliness of this world, its impurities, its godlessness. Don't look upon the life of those who have apostatized from the faith and say, I wish I were like them. I wish I had their conveniences, their wealth, their impurity, or whatever other things you notice about them that might be an allurement to your concupiscence or to your general weakness of faith and charity but rather embrace wholeheartedly the grace of fidelity that is being given to you in these times. Be more perfect in the faith. Be more perfect in the love of God. Be more perfect in the hope of heaven. Otherwise, the times are lost on you. Otherwise, the graces that are being poured out upon you will be wasted and you will be more guilty than those who have apostatized, than those who did not receive such grace. But there are many Catholics today who are here, who have received such graces, but do not understand that they must do much more than their ancestors in the preservation of the faith. And so today, as we contemplate our Lord, the Lord of history, and His second coming, and as we look around this world and are aghast at its condition, as we consider the millions and millions of people who have fallen away from the faith, let us thank God that we have the grace that we do and ask Him to preserve us in this struggle that we continue more and more right to the end, no matter what it takes, even the price of our blood, that we continue and persevere in the faith.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.